coming up on Fresh Dew with Pastor Inkechi Ene. Jesus made a demand on his faith. That is how help comes. Help comes by Jesus making a demand on your faith. Paying no attention to your sub story. Paying no attention to the troubles you've walked through. He made a demand on his faith. Dividing the word of truth. Okay, today's message is titled Positioned for the Word of Faith. This is a Word of Faith conference. So we're going to talk about being positioned, rightly positioned. For the word of faith. And I'll be reading from Luke chapter 5. I'll be teaching you this morning. So and I know that um, you're used to the teaching of the word of God. Luke chapter 5 verse 1 to 7. And I like to use the New King James Version. My pastor, Pastor Charles, used to say that God only speaks through King James. But I showed him that God also speaks through New King James. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him... To hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. We see a story here of toiled all night and caught nothing, turning into a great number of fish. That was a turnaround. That could be barren and no children turning into mother of many children. That could be sick and diseased turning into healed and whole. That could be broke, bankrupt, busted, and disgusted, turning into employer of labor, great job. So there's definitely something happened. There was a change. From toiled all night and caught nothing, we see great number of fish. How did that change happen? That's what we're going to go through. And we see that Simon Peter went through that experience, and this turnaround took place. Amen? Now, do you think... That if Simon Peter was positioned somewhere else for where Jesus was, that would have happened to him. So he had to be rightly positioned to receive the word of faith that brought about that change in his life, right? We're going to look at four things that are very important that you need to put in perspective for you 
to be rightly positioned for the word of faith. Because in this conference, it's been all about the word of faith. But you can be right here in the conference and not really be positioned rightly for the word of faith. So let's look at these four keys. First thing, look back at the text, Luke chapter 5. And I'll read now from the Passion Translation. On one occasion, Jesus was preaching to a crowd. Everybody say preaching to a crowd. On the shore of Lake Galilee, a vast multitude of people, a vast multitude of people were pushing to get close to Jesus to hear the word of God. He noticed two fishing boats at the water's edge with the fishermen nearby rinsing their nets. Jesus climbed into the boats belonging to Simon Peter and said to him, let me use your boat. Push it off a short distance from the shore so I can speak to the crowd. There definitely was a crowd, agreed? There was a vast multitude, agreed? Was it good or bad to be in that crowd? When you think of the crowd in the book of um, Acts chapter 19, the crowd at Ephesus, we're told about that crowd. It says they were everywhere, they were moving, they didn't really know what was going on. That kind of crowd you don't want to be in. But this crowd, the Bible says this crowd was focused. It says they were going to hear the word of God. And when a crowd is focused, I can tell you they're not silent. If you've been to the market, for us women who like to buy things, when you hear there's tomatoes, they're selling tomatoes in the market. The women are moving, moving. They're not quiet. What are they saying? Tomatoes. That's where tomatoes are. And what's going on? You understand that the crowd is focused on buying what? So anybody who hears tomatoes, tomatoes, if they want tomatoes, what do they do? They join the crowd. So I can tell you that this crowd was not silent. They were focused. Unlike the crowd in Acts 19, this is a crowd you want to be in. But where was Simon Peter? If you read verses 1 to 3, it's actually like a map that shows you where Simon Peter was. First of all, Jesus said to him, push Come, come, come. So I can speak to the crowd. Jesus didn't say, so I can speak to you people. What does that tell you? He wasn't in the crowd. He was in the crowd. It goes on in another verse 2 or 3, I believe, to tell us that Peter was nearby. So there was a crowd, a noisy crowd, a vocal crowd, focused, pressing to hear the word of God. Jesus was preaching to the word of God, but Peter was not in the crowd. Peter was nearby. What was Peter doing nearby? Why was he nearby? Peter was distracted. First thing, if you're going to be positioned right for the word of God, separate yourself from all forms of distraction and focus on the word of faith. Separate yourself from all forms of distraction and focus on the word of faith. A distraction is something that prevents you from concentrating on something else. Peter was nearby. The word of God was all around him. But he was distracted. Now what was he distracted doing? Verse 2. But the fishermen had gone from the boats and they were washing their nets. Everybody say washing their nets. Another version says, the message says, they were out scrubbing their nets. Get the picture. There is a crowd. A good crowd. Not an Acts 19 crowd. A crowd you want to be in. They were pressing for a good purpose. They were vocal. They were going to hear the word of God. Peter was nearby washing his net, scrubbing his net. In the Greek, there are many words that are translated wash. There's a word nipto. That means to wash a part of your body. There's another word luo. There's another word baptizo. There's a word rantizo. They're all wonderful words. They could all be translated as wash. But they are always used in the right context. The word used here for wash is a different word from all these ones I've called. It's a word pluno. Apopluno. And it means, 
It's only used in washing inanimate objects like clothes. You don't apopluno a human being. In other words, if you've got a little child who goes into potter potter and plays, and you bring that child out to wash that child, are you going to use iron scorer? Say, you this stupid boy, I've been telling you, make you know the enter potter potter. Come here. You bring, you will wound and kill that child. So you don't do that, right? So what will you do? You will nip to the child. But apopluno is used for like when you want to wash your rug or your matras where they don't soil. You, it literally means to plunge in and out. For those who used to wash in the river in those days, you plunge into so a lot of energy, a lot of effort, thorough avid concentration, attention, you are washing a lot of dirt out. That verb, that apopluno, is also used in that place, in the Greek imperfect tense. And that's a tense that is past tense with a continuing situation going on. So it's in the past, but it's continuing. What does that tell you? Peter was doing something he normally does. Peter was doing something that he has always been doing and he was still doing. Peter wasn't a lazy man, but he was distracted. What distracted him? His routine. What he has been used to. Sometimes your routine distracts you from a current move of God. God is moving. Something new is going on. But I have always been doing this. This is the way I do it. With my energy and my effort. That is why Pentecostal routine has graduated to religion. And the shift is going on. The move of God is going on. And we're blind to it. Because we're apoplunoing our nets. And Jesus is nearby. Preaching the word of faith. We're close by. But we're in our routine. Turn to your neighbor and say, Is it time to break some of your routines? Peter was distracted. He was legitimately busy in his daily routine. Glory be to God, Jesus noticed him. The Bible says, and Jesus has noticed you here. Even by the crowd, the spotlight, such is the compassion of Jesus. Such is the interest of Jesus, like pastor said, for you to receive. So you may be distracted in your mind. Distracted in your activities. Distracted even by the things you are doing for Jesus. Distracted by the work you are working for him. But there is a move of God. There is the word of faith. And you are busy apoplunoing. Using your energy to work. But Jesus noticed him. The spotlight came on him. The world will always put a spotlight on you. It will always shine you out. Somebody with a sore in her breast that is not healing. I believe it's a nipple sore here, online, wherever you are. The spotlight has come on you. You are healed in the name of Jesus. Wherever you are. The world will always put a spotlight on you. And what we're going to see that Peter did to get himself rightly positioned for that turnaround is that Peter kept making choices. He kept making choices. And his choices were the right choices. If he made the wrong choices, he would have missed that turnaround. So the spotlight came on him. 
So the first thing I told you was what? Separate yourself from all forms of distraction. He was distracted. He was distracted by his daily routine. Jesus saw him, noticed him, put a spotlight on him, and definitely, definitely, if Jesus sees you, he sees you to help you. Somebody shout, help is here. Help is here. Glory be to God. He's always our present help. In time of trouble, trouble refers to a tight place. Some of us here are in a tight place, in a tight corner. Tight corner in ministry, tight corner in your family, tight corner in your bodies, tight corner. Help is here. I said, help is here. Thank you, Jesus. So the spotlight comes on you to help you. So the spotlight came on Peter, though he was distracted. And help came. Help came from Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, help came. But how did that help come? How does that help come? Sometimes help comes and we want help to come in a particular way. You expect help. The spotlight is on you. Jesus is here. The word is here. So help must come this way. If you're broke, help must come by somebody walking up to you and offering you a job. It's got to be that way help comes. If you're sick, help may come by somebody you know, referring you to the right doctor that might help you. And there's nothing wrong with doctors. Be figured out the way help should come. So I'm sure Peter had figured out the way his help was going to come. Finally, Jesus noticed him. He looked up from his washing of his nets. Oh, there was Jesus. Oh, yikes, he's preaching the word. Okay, okay. Is this guy who's been preaching the word around the place? Is this guy who does great things? He must be here to help me and solve my problem. But what did Jesus do? How does Jesus bring help? Do you know what Jesus did? Jesus did not pity him. Hello? Had Peter had a rough night? Had Peter had a rough, tough night? Plenty effort, no profit. That sounds like some of us. Plenty effort, plenty worker for this Lagos. I told Pastor Kingsley, you have to have a call to be in Lagos. So, thank you, thank you. God did not call me here. Oh. I go to visit and I go to... Oh. Oh. If God not call you, no try ammo, you go just die before your time. <laughs> so plenty effort, no profit. Peter thought he was giving Jesus breaking news. I've toiled all night and caught nothing. That's how some of you go to God with your prayers. Breaking news, Jesus. I've been married 10 years. I never born. Breaking news, Jesus. They've not increased my salary in three years. Breaking news. Did Jesus not know? So Jesus noticed him to help him. But how did that help come? He didn't pity him. I said he did not pity him. Sometimes you go to pastor, he won't pity. I told Pastor Mildred the other day what I'd been going through. I expected to see, at least see some tears in her eyes. As someone just had, just they look me. Now, wow. You expect it to come. He didn't pity, he just, just did not pay attention to what he said. He didn't pity him. Jesus, neither did Jesus compensate him. Some of us come to God wanting compensation for our troubles. If you know what I've been going through, what I go through to come to church. Jesus, what I go through. If you know what I go through, the amount of transport, I just come, but if you know what I go through. Okay, so what next? Do you need compensation? You want Jesus to recognize your troubles? Jesus did not do that. What did he do? Jesus made a demand on his faith. That is how help comes. Help comes by Jesus making a demand on your faith. Paying no attention to your sub story. Paying no attention to the troubles you've walked through. He made a demand on his faith. 
Let me tell you a few things about how Jesus makes these demands on your faith. <laughs> he didn't compensate him. He didn't pity him. Listen to what a demand is. A demand is, a, is an insistent and peremptory English wants to embarrass itself, not me. Request made as of right. Pressing requirement. Why did Jesus do that? There must be something Jesus knew. Jesus could hear, listen, listen, listen. Jesus could hear Peter. He was saturated in the natural realm. He was soaked up by his pain and his emotions. Jesus needed to shift him. Jesus knew that without faith, it's impossible to please God. He had to drag him out of that realm. Some of you are being dragged out of that realm in this conference. You are being dragged into the supernatural realm. Into the realm where God operates. The realm where your help is. And this help comes by demands. It is still Christian. To have God place demands on your faith. And when God places these demands, he is not politically or diplomatically correct about it. One of my daughters says it this way. When you want to do something, do it with your chest. I do not understand what that means. She had to explain to me. Say, mommy, in this generation, when we say it, we mean just, if you're going to do it, do it. Jesus makes demands on your faith with his chest. He doesn't use corny. Anybody who uses corny is not demands sent by God. When God makes demands on your faith, he does it with his chest. Remember when the prophet went to the widow of Zarephath, a widow. A widow. Are you not supposed to sorry for a widow? A widow, where one died, had only one son, had prepared to die. Her grave was ready. Prophet came, noticed her. Shouldn't he have been coming to give her food? Is that not what men of God are supposed to do? Hey! Breaking news. This prophet came. Not only did he collect her last chop, he said, feed me first. Do you know how that will hit CNN? In a certain church in Port Harcourt, it was said that a pastor met a widow and took her last plate of rice and told her that he was going to eat the rice first. I wonder what all these churches are turning to. Breaking news. It's Jesus. He's making a demand on your faith. And he does it with his chest. That's how your help comes. It comes in opportunities. Boldly put before you. What is that thing God is telling you to do? What is that thing he's asked you to say? And when he makes those demands, he doesn't really care if he's going to embarrass you. Because you see, when Jesus notices you, he notices you to help you. The challenge is that we have predetermined and preordained how that help is going to come. Therefore, we miss our positioning. But it doesn't always come that way. It doesn't always come that way. When he makes those demands, he doesn't even care if it's going to embarrass you. He's making that demand on your faith. That's what he's doing. And sometimes you need to tune into that realm to hear what he's saying. Not only does he make a demand by with his chest, he makes demands of things that you already have plans for. That's what he does.
Christ due. So what are you willing to sacrifice? What you are willing to sacrifice for the word of faith? The time you are willing to give for the word of faith? The activities, routine, you are willing to give up for the word of faith? The income, whatever it is you are willing to choose how much value. It's not just to shout, I love, I love, I love. What value you've placed on the word of faith is seen in what you are willing to give up for the word of faith. Glory be to God. Are you alive, but not really living life? Do you know somewhere deep down that something needs to change in the course of your life? Does it feel like you have lost your way in life? Yet to others, you seem to know your way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Can you believe that somewhere on the inside of you? Do you believe it? He is the answer to every question. And he loves you just the way you are. Today he's waiting for you with arms open wide. And he wants you just the way you are. Will you make a decision today to surrender your life to him and run into those outstretched arms? If you want to do that, say this prayer out loud meaning it from the depth of your heart and you will be saved lord jesus i come to you today i believe you are the son of god and that you died for me and rose again just to save me come into my heart and make me brand new as you have promised. I will live for you all the days of my life. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Congratulations on taking the most important decision of your life. You are now born again and a brand new person. It has all happened on the inside of you. Now you need to grow in your new faith and what has happened on the inside will surely be reflected in your everyday life. We can help you grow in your new faith. Please call us at 0700 Fresh Dew or email us at saved at freshdew.tv and we'll be here for you. Romans 10 17 says, So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You can order today's message and other past messages on our website store, freshdew.tv. It is available on MP3 and CD and also on MP4 and DVD just as seen on TV. Fresh Dew, giving you fresh inspiration and direction for your life. Thank you for watching Fresh Dew today with Pastor Nkichi Ene. We trust you were blessed by today's episode. For further information on Fresh Dew, please call us on 0700 Fresh Dew, which is 0700 3737 4339. If you're calling from outside Nigeria, the number will be plus 234 700 3737 4339. Our phones are open from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. GMT plus one. You can also send us an email to info at freshdew.tv and we'll be glad to serve you. We also invite you to like, follow and interact with us on our Twitter and Facebook pages at Freshdew TV and also on Pastor Nkechi's Facebook pages at Pastor Ketch. For more information on how you can partner with Freshdew and receive Pastor Nkechi's monthly letters and weekly MP3 gifts, please visit our website, www.freshdew.tv. Once again, thanks for being with us today, and we look forward to seeing you next time on Fresh Dew to receive fresh inspiration and direction for your life.